Hello, welcome to this episode of Fire Dev, a fireside chat with developers. Today I have Michael Ingram on the podcast and he is the director at Me Pixel or MI Pixel. Well, I, I let him, you know, pronounce that for himself. So, yeah, Michael, if you want to do an introduction, probably be better than the one I've done. Hello everyone, my name is Michael Ingram, and no, your introduction was fine. Um, yeah, I'm director at MyPixel or MI Pixel. either one's fine really. Uh, the MI stands for Michael Ingram, which is my name, so <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay, well, well, when I saw, you know, MyPixel, I honestly didn't connect the, you know, the dots, I just thought it's a cool name, but I didn't, you know, think, oh, you know, Michael Ingram, <laughs> Pixel, because usually when people put their name in a company name, for example, they, it's usually a bit more obvious, like yeah. Michael Ingram Consultancy or Michael Ingram Limited. So that was a bit more, you know, subtle. I, was, I, I didn't quite catch on to it. So my pixel, what does it do? So my pixel is there to, well, it's there to primarily to build uh, video games. You know, um, so I'm uh, released a game called Defend from Candyland. I'm working on some others that uh, I'm not saying much about at the moment. Um. But as well as that, obviously, I'm offering services for do, uh, doing programming for other people and companies. Um, so I'm using my own skills that I've got. I've done augmented reality, software development, virtual reality, uh, games and non-games, etc. in the past. Um, I've got a small portfolio up on the website so that people can have a look. But yeah, primarily it's games because that's more fun. <laughs> It is indeed. I mean, the difference between doing just raw computer science where you're, you know, running an app or like a mobile application compared to a game when you actually see a character running around or even if it's something physical drawing, like that feeling is so much better than having a couple of buttons or some log statements yeah. compared to software development. So, yeah, definitely it's a lot more fun. But it's it's a bit harder as well. Uh, it depends on what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there is that as well. Okay, so let's talk about Defend from Candyland. So, you know, I've had a look, you know, myself, but if you want to describe it to the listeners, what is that game and where can you access it? Sure thing. Uh, so it is a tower defense game uh, done in the style of an old Flash game that I used to play a lot called Desktop Tower Defense. Um, so you plant trees, which are your towers, and you fight off against all the evil sour candy that's coming out to destroy you, basically. <laughs> um, so the way in which it works is, like I say, you, you plant all the towers, uh, they're built instantly, uh, and you can upgrade them as well. But the enemies, they their uh, walking path uh, will change when you put the towers down. So they'll find the shortest path from their entry point, which is a little spawning jelly cube, uh, to the destination tree that they're trying to destroy, uh, which there can be multiples on one level. Uh, they will find the shortest path, so your uh, aim is to place down enough towers to destroy them, but also put them down in a strategic way to slow them down by making them move uh, the longest distance as well, basically. Okay, and I see that it's a you know a pixel art style game. Like, where did that inspiration come from, or is that something you've always you know been into? Um, so th 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 there's a few answers on that one. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm doing everything myself. I'm doing the artwork. I'm doing the development work. I'm doing the design work and everything. Uh, I was originally doing the music as well, but luckily I got some help because my music was bad. Um, <laughs> but um, so uh, you, if you look at the credits on the game, the only names you'll see on there are Michael Ingram, which is me, uh, Kirsty Armstrong, which is my other half. Uh, she helped me with some of the designs and some ideas. And then Armin, and I don't know how to pronounce the surname, unfortunately, uh, but he did. Uh, he basically saw my game, liked the game, didn't like the music and offered to do the music for me, uh, which is what he's done because he uh, runs his own little music production company. Um, so when it comes to the pixel art, I've never been able to do art before. And I used to, when I did uh, development work and games before, I used to buy in the art. And people kept telling me that the biggest problem with the games I was making before was the artwork. And I was like, well, let's see what I can do. And, and I found this course on Udemy, um, which was a pixel art masterclass. Uh, I completed the course and, and uh, <clears throat> I started doing artwork, basically. But 
as well as it being the only art I can actually do, <laughs> um, I mean, I can't even draw stick men, but as well as this being the only art I can actually do, I, I grew up in the 90s. I loved playing the Mega Drive and Super Nintendo and Master System and all those consoles. I still have them and love playing them. And I really like the artwork, to be honest. I, I quite like the old pixel art. It's quite, I, I think it's quite interesting. So, yeah, a few reasons for it. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I mean, I agree. I love pixel art as well. So when I see games, either on the App Store or on on console or PC, and they've got some really nice pixel art going, you know, it just, you know, it it brings those nostalgic memories back. So also it's a bit more timeless because if you have, let's say, an early 3D game, actually, let me step back a bit. Well, with the, you know, the current capability of hardware, you know, you can go well beyond you know, graphics that looks like pixel art. So therefore, it's 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 an old sort of design that's in in many ways from a technical limitation not required anymore. The, yeah. Whereas if you're doing a 3D game, for example, you could get a 3D game from 10 years ago or one from today, and, you know, there's a big difference between them, and you can see that difference. Whereas if you do a pixel art game, a pixelated game, even though you know it's an old style, like a 20, 30-year-old, maybe even a 40-year-old style of making games, because it's no longer, you know, the main way of, you know, you having to make games, it looks retro, it looks classic. So, yeah, the, that's the thing, you know, I really do, you know, like about, you know, pixel art. And I've tried to create a bit myself, and I'm, I'm better at that than, you know, regular artwork even then pixel art is pretty difficult especially when you're putting a lot of care attention and making it look not generic and making it look like everything just you know connects nicely together so yeah. you said that you had like what was the guy's name again that you said who did the music for uh, the Armin. Armin. okay that you had him he did the music for it how did that i mean you told me how that came about was your game already available was there a, a trailer that he saw because i see this early access game right now on steam so how did he come across it and he decided to you know reach out to you uh, so the, there was actually a trailer um and uh, that trailer is no longer on steam because of the bad music <laughs> but there was a, an original trailer that i made that was um being shared around twitter and that kind of thing and he actually found me through that and messaged me directly on Twitter offering to do the music for me because uh, uh, he was saying that he really liked the look of the game. He thought it was really interesting, but uh, obviously the music was the biggest problem um, because, <laughs> like I say, I can't do music. I can play a piano, but I can't do music like on the computer and all that. I just not very good at it. Um, and so uh, he actually offered to do it for me, like I say, and... Um, yeah, I, I was really happy with the music that uh, he came up with. Um, I was really happy with it. I'm, and uh, I still talk to him now. He's a lovely guy. So, yeah. Okay. And what sort of, you know, deal did you have with him? Was it, you know, he has X amount of money or was it X percentage or is he a blend of both? Uh, no, it was neither, to be honest. He actually kind of did it as a favor because of, uh, he just, because, uh, I mean, when it came to it, I was, this was my first game, my first Steam release, and so I didn't really have money to pay for services uh, and all that at the beginning because uh, I'm going from, uh, unfortunately, trying to get into this out of being ill for the past few years. Uh, so it's one of those things of I have the limitations that I've got. And, uh, he, yeah, he, he, um, he I basically put his name down on the game, um, which he didn't even ask me to do that. Uh, he just asked for his name, uh, his company website to be on the bottom of the Steam page, which I've, I've obviously I've done. Uh, and, um, yeah, that that's all it was that he asked for. Okay, I mean, that's pretty cool. I mean, yeah, I was actually, very lucky there. yeah especially in this day and age, to, to get someone you know, that nice and that helpful. And yeah. he, what else had he you know, worked on or done? you know, prior to doing this? Um, I honestly couldn't say without looking on his website. Uh, okay. I cannot remember. But <laughs> um, I, uh, I, like I say, I can have a look on his web- website too because I've obviously got a computer in front of me, but um, I should be able to find it. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, no, uh, I, I honestly couldn't remember. My memory's not that great. Okay, right. fair enough. <laughs> and how long has Defend from Candyland been out for? And... 
if he doesn't mind answering, how well has it done in terms of downloads? Yep, so Defend from Candleland has been out since uh, January 10th um, of last... Uh, no, this year, sorry. Uh, nearly the wrong year there. Uh, so January 10th of this year. Um, Downloads-wise, it's not done that great, to be honest with you. Um, it's had um, a fair few, but most of them have been during sales. Um, so it's not made that much money, uh, in all honesty. Okay, and the is that sales that you've been doing, or is that just general Steam sales, like summer sales, etc.? Uh, it's st um, so Steam sales. I've been putting them forward. Um, I've got a few more lined up. Um, but my problem is that I'm not very good at marketing. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's one of those things. I, I keep getting uh, people that play the game keep telling me uh, that they like the game, uh, that they like really have enjoyed it that, that they found some things difficult I and mean, it's only the game's only had good reviews but at, at the same time i can't get the game out there more i'm not very good at that <laughs> yeah if, if one of the things i know something that i've struggled with in the past when i've released stuff is i mean partly knowing how to market it, especially when you're coming from you know a low budget secondly you know wanting to market it yeah, as well, like it, it, I don't know about you. Sometimes I feel like if I'm if if I made something and I've got to market it, I feel like you know I'm wasting time. I could be you know developing. I could be yeah. doing design. I could be doing other more productive stuff. But you know, it's it's getting that realization that this is productive. If the end goal is to have a successful you know product, yeah. then obviously you have got to have the product. So therefore, you got to make it. So the developing, the design, the planning, all that stuff is obviously important. But yeah. then the successful part, which is if that is part of your goal, it you know does come with marketing. It does come with promotion. So yeah, that is one of those you know interesting ones. What I will say, I, again, I've had no breakout hit in any form or one or one or another. But I've had a little bit, a little bit of success over the years on different stuff that I've done. And the biggest thing I will say, and you probably won't hear this advice much, is controlled spamming effectively <laughs> it's stuff that people that aren't you know making games and putting it out there want to see or hear and but it's what you got to do if you're a bit if you're big then even then if a big company is still spamming but they're doing it on in a way that their budget makes it look like it's not spamming because you yeah. know if you've seen that advert you know all the time on tv on your phone you know banners you know what is that other than spamming but yeah. it's a bit more subtle in a way that you don't annoy people, let's say, because I, you know, I posted on Reddit groups. So that's what I recommend. Reddit groups, Facebook groups, hmm. uh, you know, blogs and whatnot. And just, you know, just share it as much as possible and just get used to getting banned from some of these groups. And that's another thing that I will say that's happened to me before. So that's what I would say, you know, create a block of master list of, vlog i mean blogs to that you know let's say for your case it's a game so that are game blogs that you know especially that the ones that have a submission form or some sort of submission process yeah. and you know submit to them like try and get like 30 40 50 you know plus you know link you know urls just having a spreadsheet so you've got it and the next you know game release or the next update you've just got them there have like a master list of you know subreddits have a master list of Facebook groups, Twitter pages, you know, get like a, you know, a sort of message template and they, yeah. that, that you can modify. And obviously if you tweak each one to be more relevant, that's even better. But when you're, you know, posting it to potentially hundreds of different outlets, it's, it's, a, it's very hard to do. So, but that would be my recommendation is spam it, but, you know, do it in a controlled way. But but you'll get some pushback. But that would be my recommendation. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've had some uh, some conversations with different people about the best things to do. Um, I saw there was this Indy five k thing. I, I was looking at that. Um, I did the three lectures that they gave away for free, but those three lectures didn't tell me anything I didn't already know. Unfortunately, um, yeah. Was one unfortunately, unfortunately, most people don't want to, you know say it the way it is like they want to put it like you, a lot of people if you were asked if they answer the same question they would say oh you know you know just keep making a good product you know just keep updating it you know just keep you know 
you know, talking, you know, just, you know, promoting it, but then, but they're not talking about what the promoting look like. Yeah. And they may say, oh, you know, use ads, you know, Facebook ads, but uh, honestly, I've tried ads before. And unless you've got a huge budget, it is not worth it. Like putting a hundred pound every week or every month or so, which again, is not a small amount of money in it. Anyway, but just putting like the odd hundred here or there, that gets eaten up very quickly in the ad space, and it does jack all in terms yeah. of you know click through rate because you'll get a lot of impressions. It will definitely give you the impression, but ultimately you want that follow through where they click through, they download, they watch your video, whatever you know your you know content is. So yeah, yeah definitely you want to basically have have a master list. There are other ways. Of doing it as well but effectively you you're going to be reaching out to media outlets the other thing is i mean you've probably already done this but you know reaching out to friends and family yeah. and um, that will download the game you know obviously if it's pay you know give them some sort of coupon and so so they don't have to you know buy it themselves that will download it get them to do a five star review but obviously during that process if you haven't already done it you'll learn who you know, really is a close friend or family member, and the ones that you know on the are on the surface level. Because I've I've done it before where I've contacted them, and something that should take like a minute to do, they'll yeah. I'll contact them like a month later, and they still haven't done it. So I'm just asking for a quick favor, or they'll say stuff like, you know, I'll, you know, I download it, I check it out. If it if it gets a five star, I'll give it a five star. Like you know, friends that I would call close friends. They'll say that, and if not, I'll you know give a low rating. I'm like, that's not you know what I need from a friend. I need a yeah. you know obviously you need someone that will you know just click on it, review, and be like done, dusted. You know I'll let you know when I've released something. You do the same for me. You know that's what you need. So obviously in that process, you'll come up, you'll figure out the people that are more receptive, and you'll just obviously hit them up. You know yeah. in future updates and future games. So that's another thing that I would recommend doing as well. But obviously. Outside the podcast, I can say, you know share some links and share some you know more stuff to hopefully try and help you know make defend from Candyland and you know future projects more successful as well. Thank you. Uh, when it comes to my future projects, I've got uh, different things that are planned. Um, like I've got two games that are designed and that I've started work on, uh, but I'm not saying much about them yet because. Well, with one of them, it's more it's a, a secret that's uh, going to be fun when it's out, and the other one, it's more that the design is changing constantly at the moment mm-hmm. because uh, of doing research into what's um, in that market and what people want in that market, and then designing the game around what the people are actually after. Whereas with Defend from Candyland, it was my first Steam game. It was originally designed as a mobile game because uh, that's what I used to do was mobile games. And um, then it was kind of changed as it went, but it turned it turned into this little project that was ended up being my first Steam game, first my, uh, the first game that I've made where I've done all of the artwork for it, and and all these little things that kind of made it more of a thing for me rather than rather than a marketable game. It, it is a marketable game. It is a game that's got currently sixty levels. It's, going to have 120 levels it's got a load of lo- hours and hours worth of content in there um and uh and all that and there's more and more being added to it i i, I keep on adding things based on player feedback at the moment I, i'm currently doing a massive art overhaul on it because there were some people that are saying that the artwork wasn't um good enough so i've ended up um like redrawing absolutely everything is taking me ages but um <laughs> but i'm going through and like updating it all because it's what the players want um, but yeah, so I've I've got some plans uh, uh, set aside, but uh, I know what you mean about the friends one because it's like I know that my Facebook, for instance, because uh, that's that's what basically everyone has, isn't it? Um, yeah. <laughs> my my Facebook has about four hundred odd people on it. Um, and you know I I've posted the I've been posting about the game all the time. I've I've invited everybody on my Facebook to like the page and yet the page still only has about like for the, and that's for MI pixel and the page only has about 53 likes and not all of them are people from my Facebook. In fact, most of them aren't, <laughs> you know, it is one of those things. And, uh, I, it was my other half's friends were actually ended up being the beta testers for it. And they gave me great feedback. They've, they've done all these different things for me. Um, helps me out with it, posted about it, reshared things and all that. Um, but obviously they 
aren't allowed to write the reviews because of the fact that they got the game given to them for free. Uh, so Steam doesn't allow them to. Um, so they haven't been able to write any reviews. But I've contacted like my other friends and said, look, it's out. I can give you a free copy of, uh, of the game that, that isn't a beta test copy. So I can give you a free copy of the game. You can write a review or even just tell me about the game if there's anything that needs done and not a single one of them has actually got back to me <laughs> it's only my other house friends that have not mine which is uh, always fun isn't it <laughs> yeah it, it, it's crazy when you reach out and it's just silence yeah <laughs> and you don't think it would take like such a small it, it'll, be, it'll be such a small amount of time just you know not asking for a huge essay in the reviews, just a quick couple of lines, you know, five out of five, you know, you, 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 you know, it means the world when, you know, you're an indie developer, when you're releasing stuff that doesn't have the clout that let's say EA does where they can just, you know, market the hell out of it. But yeah, it is unfortunately one of those things. Your Facebook page does have one extra like now I have liked the page. (laughs) Thank you you very much. (laughs) You have that going now. Okay. So I just want to, Talk a bit about the process for uploading games to Steam and just the general process of putting it on there. Because I made games for mobile. Uh, I've considered it and talked to to some friends about doing some stuff for Steam. Never got around to doing it for various reasons. But how was that process? So I found the process to be really simple, to be honest. And as someone that used to do mobile games before... Mm -hmm. Uh, I would say it's you're better off doing uh, things on Steam and PC and that kind of thing instead. Because um, the mobile market... Are you doing Android or iOS? or both? Um, When I do it, I do both. Right, yeah. Because um, I, when I did it, I only did Android because, well, iOS was expensive because you needed to have a Mac, an iPhone, yes. an iPad, and then it was £100 a year, um, unless that's changed. Uh, but it's still it's still the same. Yeah, so it's expensive. It's very expensive. But um, when it comes to Android, where all you need is twenty five dollars for a one off license, it's got like millions upon millions of games being added constantly, which means getting you on scene is very very difficult. Um, <laughs> uh, so I I, I had um. I had a bit of luck when I was doing it. I used to run a company called Rex Gaming Days. And it was called that because it started off as a YouTube channel uh, that I used to do uh, where I was playing retro games and, and doing stupid voices and that kind of thing while I was doing it as well. Uh, <laughs> different accents and all the rest of it. Um, silly little things. But it's what I used to do years ago. And um, I released a game called Magical Defense. And uh, it's always magical and defending with me for some reason. Uh <laughs> <laughs> but I did this game called Magical Defense, and it was a mobile game where you controlled three mages and you shot off against all the zombies that were coming after you. Um, and I, I had a bit of luck that I got seen by a company called Reward Mob, uh, which were a Bitcoin um, tokens company. And they offered to do these tournaments uh, for me, and uh, it got me a load of advertising, it even got me a new uh, trailer video made by them, which I didn't, I didn't have to pay for. And all this stuff, it got me a bunch of new players. I ended up uh, on the one game getting about 2,000 odd downloads um, and uh, people playing it every week because they were going into this competition. But then, just like with a lot of uh, different companies that appear from nothing and all that, the company disappeared. Um, I don't know the ins and outs of what's happened, uh, but there was a lot of talk about the uh, people basically taking the money that they got for funding and buying houses in America and that kind of a thing. And so they ran off and the whole reward mob thing just got shut down, which meant obviously all the com- uh, games that were using in the uh, company in their tournaments, they kind of ended up getting messed around as well. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've not been very lucky in the past on this, unfortunately, <laughs> but um, you know, uh, so yeah, but that it was, when it was working, it was great for the mobile games, having that reward mob thing and all that. It, it was great. But, like I say, then they just ran off with the money, basically. So Okay, so did you see none of them, or did, did the developer see none of the money, or 
did you see some of it and then a big chunk of it they had? Uh, developers saw none of the money. Not a single developer saw any of it that I know of. Um, okay. Uh, the tournaments that were running, I think some people got their Bitcoins, which were called Armob tokens. But, of course, when the company went down, they become worth nothing. Of course, yeah, because they're within the ecosystem. And if the ecosystem ceases to exist and you can't you know, take it out of it, then obviously it's worthless. So... Yeah. When you are, you know, uploading games to Steam, like what is the format? Because obviously, with you know, Android and iOS to have a particular file format, you know, has to be zipped in a certain way. There's a lot of you know restrictions. Uh, how is it with Steam? You know, when you can get effectively a .exe out of pretty much any IDE for your game, whether you're using SFML, Cocast, SDL, Unreal, whatever it is, like what gets uploaded what are the restrictions around steam games so i i just do it through unity uh there was okay. a steamworks plugin um that i think they've got it set up for unreal but then there's another one that's set up for unity so i i got the unity version of the plugin loaded it into the game um just had to, uh, if i remember I'd, it's a while ago since I've set it up. Um, but if I remember rightly, I just had to like put in some details about the game uh, into the plugin. Um, if I wanted to use more like achievements, I had to do calls to it, uh, which there are achievements in Defend from Candyland. So I've done some calls to the Steamworks plugin, um, things like that. And then it was just a, a standard PC build. Um, and then they have uh, this system. Uh, which you download, and you have to basically change a text file to put notes up with it. Uh, double click on their little program, and uh, I'm trying to see where it all goes now because uh, I'm trying to get this as accurate as I can for you, but my memory is dreadful. Uh, <laughs> and, and I did this not that long ago, uploading uh, uh, a update. So <laughs> it's uh, one of, one of the lovely things with. Um, having memory like I've got. Um, <laughs> but yeah, basically there's a, a file, you just double click it and it pushes it up into the Steam's website um, and uh, it puts it in as a depot, then uh, like as a build depot, and you can put it onto the testing branch so that you can download a test version onto your own Steam client because it's always best to double check in Steam um, as well as uh, on Unity because there have been so many times that it's worked absolutely fine in Unity, but as soon as I put it into Steam, there's been an issue. And it's always best to do a testing run first. Um, but yeah, and then it's just switch it over to a build and hit release, basically. So it's very, very easy to work with. Okay. And in terms of review process, is there any review process with Steam? Because obviously when you submit to Apple, they, you know, it goes through a review process that can you know, take a, you know, a day or two all the way up to you know, multiple weeks, depending on how busy they are. And what type of app you made with Google? There's not really much of a review process. It just takes a more of just like a propagation um, time frame. Like, what's the process on Steam once you've hit go? So with Steam, um, you have to set up a company first, um, which they they do a little review process on that. But I don't remember it taking that long; just a couple of days or so. Uh, in which case, they just needed to double check the bank accounts and uh, all of that kind of thing. And then when it comes to submitting your game for the first time, you have to pay the uh, fee, which is $100, um, and it's a one-off fee for that uh, per game. You pay that $100, and you get your space with the name and all, all of that, uh, and your app ID. Um, then I, I believe the review process was just a few days for that. And then when it comes to doing updates on that on the game, it, they happen instantly. Um with the updates that they just as soon as you push it out it's done okay oh, that's pretty cool yeah because obviously you know doing it especially for ios it, it, it is you know a nice to have you know a different type of process so yeah. is uh i don't think it is but you'll probably know more than i will is steam green light still around and uh, how is it different to you know the steam you know game submission that you're using in all honesty, I, I honestly couldn't say. Um, okay. <laughs> I, I'll be uh, be honest with you. I mean, as, as far as I'm aware, it probably is. But I mean, like I said, I released Defend from Candyland um, back in January. Um, so I would have 
dealt with all of that back then. I'm I'm not going to remember most of that now, unfortunately. Okay, that's <laughs> I, do, fine. I, I do apologize for the memory. No, thing, no, but, it's, um, it's not a problem. It's the same with me. You know, when you're doing it, you, you, it seems so stressful, or you know, you got you know, there's just so much, and then later on, you just forget, and then you go back to some old project or some more old documentation. You like, I did this and I did that. I don't. Uh, you know all that stuff that you went through just to you know get this thing up there yeah how it is yeah for for me unfortunately um uh to put it simply i've got a few health issues uh and uh unfortunately included in that health issue is i've only basically got half of my left brain and the fall of my right brain uh because um it's damaged <laughs> basically <laughs> uh, to put it to put it simply it's damaged <laughs> so my memory is a bit affected unfortunately okay uh, if you don't mind me asking is that something you was born with or was that something that happened later uh, in life well uh, if uh, i don't mind you asking it it's absolutely fine I'm, I'm open to talk about my issues so um do you know what a cerebral aneurysm is I've heard of them multiple times. I can have a I can hazard a guess, but probably best if you you, you know explain it basically. Explain it. <laughs> yeah, that that's fine. So I have a cerebral aneurysm, um, and that is basically uh, there's four main uh, blood vessels uh, in the brain, and uh, an aneurysm is when a blood vessel uh, swells up uh, like a balloon. And I, when I was 16, I'm 33 now, when I was 16, um, I had an epileptic fit, which is when you fall unconscious and do the disco on the floor kind of thing. Um, And uh, I woke up in the hospital. Um, They did an uh, MRI on me because I'd had headaches for years. And uh, then I wasn't allowed to go home for about a month. Um, (laughs) And... uh, so the blood vessel uh, in my brain has swollen up and it dug deep into the center of the left brain. Um, and it's one of the largest they've seen and they'd never really seen one uh, <clears throat> or they don't really see them in children. And like I said, I was 16 at the time when they found it. So I, I was in the middle of Basildon Hospital. Um, and it was quite funny because of my outlook on life. I've always just kind of sat there and went, eh, whatever happens, I'll be fine. And I had that attitude with the aneurysm as well. So the doctors were explaining to me what the problem was. And I was just turning around and going, yeah, I'll be fine. Uh, and they were then getting other people to explain it because they thought that I didn't understand until I turned around to them and I said, no, if it bursts, I'm dead. Um, and uh, you currently don't know what to do. I'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so they, un- they they kind of realized I did understand entirely what it was. Um, but, uh, yeah, I was en- I ended up being sent to a National uh, Hospital of Neurology and Neurosurgery in Queen Square in London, uh, where I had two platinum coiling surgeries, which is where they go into your brain and inject platinum into it, to into the aneurysm to basically stop it from filling. Um, and unfortunately, that didn't work either. And uh, before the first bit of surgery, I I only had, they guesstimated around a month or so left to live um, before the first bit of surgery was done. Uh, And like I say, the the surgery worked and didn't work all at the same time. It's um, so it slowed down uh, the aneurysm from uh, the, the aneurysm filling, but it didn't stop it. So they went on to do something else called a balloon test, which uh, you have to be awake for. And it's blooming horrible to go through uh, because you're awake on the table whilst they're going through your arteries and your legs to get to your brain to blow up a balloon inside it and then sit there and go, so how does that feel? (laughs) Well, it feels like I've got a balloon in my head. Um, (laughs) But they ended up doing all of that. And um, when we came to reviewing the uh, scans, and this is one of the things I always find funny, when I came to reviewing scans, uh, so I went back to see if I was going to have this balloon put in and left. They're suddenly gone, uh, we're not going to do it. I was like, oh, why? Uh, was it not a success? And I'm like, well, the balloon was a success. Like, what's a success? You can have it, but you've gained a deep vein thrombosis. And I turned around and went, you mean a blood clot? They're like, yeah. I'm going, so I've got a blood clot in my brain. They're going, yeah. And I'm going, doesn't that kill you? And they're going, well, it's grown in the exact place to cancel out the aneurysm. <laughs> 
<laughs> so it's blocked it and saved you from that. I was like, oh, <laughs> fair enough. That's pretty crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was uh, definitely a weird one. And I, I now still get MRIs every two years. The bl- uh, blood clots disappeared, but the aneurysm, whilst the blood clot was there, the aneurysm emptied, so the, the blood emptied out of it, and it deflated. So it's like a deflated balloon in my head now instead. So, um, yeah, but unfortunately with that comes memory issues and a few other problems, <laughs> basically. I mean, that's that's pretty tense. That's pretty insane. Yeah, um, it's my life. <laughs> uh, it's it's one of those things where life's amazing, but it also can be crazy and you know terrifying as well at the same time. Yeah, it certainly can be. Yeah. Uh, all, all I know is if the, uh, is you know the aneurysm is deflated, so its likelihood of bursting is very very low. So okay. I'll just go with that. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Uh, they're the least that good news. Yeah, exactly. So there's yeah. some good news. Yeah, <laughs> but that's why my that's why you're asking me questions and I, I don't remember the answers. I that's, do apologize. That's not a problem. We can move on. So, <laughs> how long have you been a developer for? Um, I don't know. Um, let's see. I finished university in 2015. Uh, that was when I did, uh, so I did a uh, games development course 2012 to 15. Before that, I was doing something else called Train to, uh, Train to Game, and I did do a Flash Action Script course as well um, before that. So, yeah, be around around that sort of time, I suppose, professionally. Uh, I, you know, I was hired as a software engineer in uh, 2015 when I left university, so that would be when it started as in business and be from then I guess. okay that's pretty cool and what made you become a developer uh well i've not got the body to do sports or anything like that um i couldn't do an only fans page either uh <laughs> no you um, never know you never know <laughs> no uh in all honesty i i i loved video games growing up i, I had the meg drive and the sega channel which downloaded like 50 games to the console every month and I grew up playing those games constantly. Um, and I, I just always loved video games. They, they were my little escape when I was younger uh, and when I was older as well, to be honest. So I kind of wanted to build video games to help like help other people, like bring other people joy uh, like they brought me. So, yeah. And also I wanted to make some games that I haven't seen yet. You know, some, some little aspects that i haven't seen done it's it's like uh, i know that um fans of uh, the supernatural tv series have been saying for a, a while you know why isn't there a supernatural game and whilst i wouldn't be able to make one because of not having the rights and all that from warner brothers i could still make something that's similar enough like a demon hunting game which you know they might enjoy it's that kind of thing fair enough and what do you wish you knew when you started that you know now? Dang, I was going to say marketing, and then you said that I know now, so I don't know marketing still. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at least you know now that you need to do it. Maybe that would be one of the things to <laughs> know that you need to do it so you can learn how to do it. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, I, you know, honestly, I'm I'm not sure. Um when it comes to that, because I, mean, I it's like we defend from Candyland. I know that I did that wrong. Not that the game doesn't work or things like that. The game works. Um, you know, it's got a uh, half decent art in it. It's getting better art in it. Um, and you know, people ha- are genuinely enjoying the games, but I know that I did it wrong uh, in the fact that I didn't do my market research and that kind of thing before uh, building and releasing the game. But I think releasing the game and still working on it as I, as I am without having that knowledge at first has kind of shown me just how important it is to have that knowledge and to do it the other kind of way next time. Um, so yeah, it's one of those things. I think if I, if I, if I knew that stuff beforehand and so didn't try it, I wouldn't know how important it was. So uh, I'm, I'm quite happy how I am, I guess. 
Okay, so do you regret becoming a developer? No. Christ, no. No. Okay, well, no <laughs> short answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I, I don't. Uh, I, I find the coding work fun. Uh, I've been learning the pixel art as well. And whilst I get more frustrated with doing the artwork compared to the coding work, um, I still find it enjoyable. I, as my health problems, as I mentioned earlier, I can't really work in an office. It, it, it unfortunately, I, I have a lot of problems. Like I can have a lot of problems with stress, ironically. Uh, but I don't stress myself out when I'm working for myself. Um, the, just how it is. Uh, so. Yeah, no, I, I don't regret it at all. I, I love it. I, I really enjoy it. And, yeah, I, I want to try and make some good things uh, for people to play. Okay, that's pretty cool. And how do you find the indie life and do you regret it? I mean, I've kind of, you know, can guess on the answer <laughs> just based on what you've just said, but I'll ask it anyway. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, no, um, so the indie life is it's difficult. Uh, I'll be mm-hmm. honest. It, it's difficult because, I mean, at the moment, I'm I'm a solo dev. You know, I mean, like I say, my other half helps with ideas, and I've had help with music from Armin and that. But um, you know, I have a lot of work to do, and I'm trying to get on top of my physical health as well. So I've been going to the gym a lot and trying to lose weight and that kind of thing. Um, so I've got a lot of things uh, that's going on at the same time, but I with how difficult it is because of mostly because of lack of money at the moment more than anything else but i'm hoping to try and fix that but it's still for me easier than working for somebody else in an office um when i when i've worked in offices a a few years ago i was having to use a walking stick to walk around um and found out that it was stress that was making me lose the ability to use my legs (laughs) of all things and it was just working for other people was putting me under so much stress i was using a walking stick because i couldn't walk without one nowadays i'm going to the gym and i'm running on a treadmill for 20 minutes it's you know so for me don't get me wrong indie life is difficult and you know there are ups and downs with it but I really enjoy it, and for me, it's easier than like than the normality, basically. <laughs> Fair enough. And what do you hate or dislike about being a developer? Um, um, not being social enough to uh, to know what to do for marketing. No. Um... <laughs> <laughs> uh no i i don't know i don't really i don't really dislike anything about being a developer to be honest okay i I couldn't really think of anything okay if you could work on any product past present or future what would it be and uh, and why so do you know of an old mega drive game called comic zone it doesn't ring about comic zone or comet zone uh, comics, C O M I X. No, I'm having a quick Google now. But yeah, if you if you want to continue, yeah, that's right. So, Comic Zone was a game on the Mega Drive. The music was done by Howard Drossin, and it has some of the best music and s- such. It is my absolute favorite game of all time. My absolute favorite. I've not found a game that beats it for me, and it is such a unique way of doing uh, level progression and everything else as well because with the game you are sketch turner you've been thrown into your comic um and you have to travel across the panels and you're facing all these different uh, creatures that are being drawn in by the villain of your comic and it was such such a brilliant game i'd love to have worked on it I, i'd i'd absolutely love to have worked on that <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a pretty cool concept. I just had a quick Google look to the image. It does look pretty darn cool. And especially for the Mega Drive, you know, because obviously it, for that era, those sort of graphics was, you know, the yeah. thing that was in at the time. But I think something like that maybe exists, something else like that. Now, but I think something like that now could be pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, but possibly. Yeah, it, it could. I mean, could you imagine if Marvel did something like that using their comic? Oh, game? yeah. I mean, that would be insane. And especially if he was a bit more dynamic, depending on, let's say, if you could choose, you know, 
create your own character. You could, yeah. you know, choose a few story elements. So the enemies that were either spawned or created were a bit more relevant or maybe even location based. So if you're in the UK or in the US, the type of enemies spawn might be relevant to the scenery and the weather around here. I mean, that would be pretty darn cool. Yeah, it would it'd be amazing. Like, like saying, there is one bit of good news I have about that uh, that particular game, though. Okay. Uh, Sega did announce that they were making a movie of it now. Oh, is that just a recent announcement? I, yeah. Uh... yeah, it was about a month or so ago. Um, Sega did an announcement saying that they were doing, uh, um, they were doing two more retro games were being turned into films, and that was one of them. It's Comic Zone, mm. and I am very much looking forward to that. <laughs> I mean, just a little bit of googling that I've done about the game. It looks like an interesting, unique concept. So. I'll just be interested, not from a fan perspective, but just from a technical perspective, how they do that. Because it's not just like another, you know, action game. It's an action game with like a, you know, the comic twist. So yeah, and I'm yeah. guessing you would obviously want to see that, you know, like the comic book style pages and some sort of drawing element, yeah. uh, you know, going on. Have they given some release date, or is it just basically an announcement at the moment? Uh, as far as I know, it's just an announcement at the moment, and I can't even remember what the other game uh, was, to be honest with you. Okay. Um, it'd be worth uh, looking at, um, uh, because it would, like I say, it was because of the, I think it was due to the success of the first and second Sonic the Hedgehog movies. Yeah. Um, because obviously they were very successful. Uh, and they, they were very they good were. films. I yeah, know. I mean, I agree. I think for what they were, they were good. I mean, for number one, more than number two. But I feel for they were good movies, because especially considering... You know, the, you know, historically when we've had games turn from games into, I mean, move, you know, games turn into movies or, you know, vice versa, movies turn into games, they have not been the best. And these were, you know, pretty good. So I think they did a good job overall. Yeah, I'll, I'll say um, uh, and this might be an unpopular opinion. And so I apologize now to anyone that disagrees. Um, but for me, I, I loved the first and second Sonic the Hedgehog movies. The only thing I didn't like was I did not like Jim Carrey's Robotnik. <laughs> I mean, I liked it from the perspective of the acting. I just, because he's, he's, Robotnik's, uh, you know, a big fat character, yeah. and he's obviously not that. Like, yeah. it, it, if they had CGI'd his face onto, like, a bigger, rounder character that would look more like Robotnik, which they have the tech to do, that, that wouldn't have been an issue. That would have been fine, because obviously his mannerisms, you know, I like, and... I enjoyed that bit, but I agree. He didn't look like the Robotnik from the games. See, that, that's the thing for me. It wasn't even the looks that bothered me. It was more that um, as soon as I heard that Jim Carrey was going to be Robotnik, mm. I, I turned around to my other half and I said, I hope he actually acts Robotnik rather than acting Jim Carrey. Acting. No, nah, he was definitely acting Ace Ventura. <laughs> exactly. Mask, basically. Thing. It was very like like you say. It was very much Ace Ventura dressed up like Robotnik, yeah. and that's what bothered me with it. I mean, doing the snot rocket with a robot. Don't get me wrong; it was funny, but it wasn't Robotnik. <laughs> yeah, that's fair enough. Uh, that 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 was my thing with it. But like I say, I still love the films anyway. I'm still getting them on Blu-ray when the third one comes out. Um, yeah, don't know if any more are coming out after that. But uh, I, I'm still going to be getting. It. I still loved them. I still saw them both in cinema. So. You know, it's one of those things. It's my little my little gripe with it is, is Jim Carrey's Robotnik was well, Jim Carrey, <laughs> not Robotnik. But yeah, it's one of those things. I, I normally I, I normally love his stuff as an actor. I, I, I for me, his best film is The Mask. But I didn't want to see The Mask in Sonic. <laughs> no, no, of course not. <laughs> uh, it's just one of those things, though. But uh, it, it's just yeah, like I say, it's just one of those things. <laughs> Yeah, I mean they are. I think they are making a Tails solo movie as well. I think are they really? Yeah, I'm. I'm. I, I want to say they did make that announcement not long after the you know Sonic Two came out. So they're doing Sonic Three. I think they do. I think they're doing a Tails as well. Oh. Uh, and I think they might spin it off with some other ones and try and create some some sort of cinematic universe. You know, for Sonic because the first two, like you said, have done well. So why yeah. not? Yeah, I, I am a bit worried about the third one. I, w I will admit, um, because the third one they're introducing, obviously, if you've seen past the credits in the second movie, you know the character that they're introducing. Uh, I don't want to say too much and give spoilers to people listening to this uh, cast, but um, they've 
ruined that character before <laughs> when they did the standalone game with them and it is yeah yeah you, you know where i'm going with that one don't yeah you? yeah i know uh, uh, i remember yeah i mean why did they do that i mean yeah you but, never yeah, know they cool. might do a decent job yeah i'm, I'm hoping that they do I, I am hoping that they do um like i say i'm still gonna watch it in cinema yeah again so <laughs> Okay, and what careers did you think about as an alternative growing up? Um, <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Uh, so when I was growing up, I was um typical nineties kid. Um, <laughs> I was into wrestling and that kind of thing. Uh, so uh, but unfortunately, um, the aneurysm kind of put a stop to that. I wasn't allowed to do. Uh, martial arts or anything like that so even though I wanted to um, I wasn't allowed not allowed to, wasn't allowed contact on the head um, so aside from that it, it just became the games programming and that was it there wasn't really another choice after that okay and because obviously you've heavily talked about games programming have you ever done non-games programming and yeah. what's your opinion around that stuff uh, yes, so I I did uh, I've done a few different projects. I I used to do augmented reality programming, and virtual reality programming as well. When I worked at HSSMI, um, that was as a software engineer where I was doing augmented reality, virtual reality, and that kind of a thing. Um, I quite like um, I quite like robotics uh, programming, like you, uh, doing Raspberry Pis, Arduinos, and you know make making thing mo- uh, things move like animatronics. I find that quite fun. Um, I did a project a while ago where I, um, in fact, I've got videos of it on my website, uh, which is mipixel.co.uk, um, in my portfolio, where I, I created an application on an iPad that sent different signals to devices using a uh, router and a local area network, all in the back of a car. And it made, uh, so the iPad interacted with a TV to switch the TV on, turn it over to Xbox or Apple TV, and then it interacted with the chairs to make the uh, chairs recline back or go forward, put on vibrate and heat mode on the chairs, uh, did all the light signals and sent us and that across so you could just change all the uh, colors of the lights in the back of this very fancy car um, <laughs> and all that kind of thing. That, that was quite fun doing that, to be honest. Um like I say, I, I've done some very small amounts of robotics. I, I, I was trying to make a um, robotic arm that uh, moved using flex sensors and that kind of thing, send signals across to move the motors, to move the fingers around. And I was originally doing it because um, I used to go to the London MCM Expo and I, I used to dress up all the time as anime characters and that kind of thing. Um, so I, I was trying to make this arm so that I could dress up as Ash Williams from Evil Dead and just have one arm hidden behind the chainsaw and then the other arm uh, like would be a prosthetic fake arm covered in blood on my chest and I was going to like have it move and uh, run around basically using the other arm that was hidden. Uh, so it was a little fake attacking dead eye arm kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, it, that kind of thing's fun, but um, I do prefer the games programming. <laughs> okay, fair enough. And... Do you have a dream company to work at? Why and what would you like to do there? Um, uh, so I, I would much prefer to just get my own stuff working, to be honest with you, and, and bringing things in properly. Because like I mentioned earlier, I'm better off working for myself because um, I can deal with my health, whereas other people generally don't. Um but I suppose if if there was any company for me to work for, probably Sega, and uh, just because of the fact that I, I I was a Sega kid, I still am a Sega. Well, I'm a Sega adult now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I've always been a, a Sega guy. Uh, I've like I said, I've still got the Mega Drive and Master System set up. Um, I still love all the games, and and yeah, so because of the amount of joy that they brought me throughout my childhood with all the games and that that I had um was like I say having the Sega channel had access to 50 different games a month where I had all that access as a child and I grew up with all those if I had, if I could work for any company it would be Sega <laughs> okay nice answer and um, what do you think of remote working versus in the office uh, I much prefer the idea of remote working to in the office because when when it comes to working in the office, nine times out of ten, it's stuff that you can do at home anyway. Um, mm-hmm. 
and uh, I think companies could save a lot of money on their offices because office space is not cheap. Um, nope. So they could save a lot of money on uh, on their offices if if they bought a PC for all of their workers instead. Uh, I mean, you know, if if they if they uh, just just did that, I mean, they're buying a PC for them all in the office anyway. Oh, so yeah. if, if they just uh, d- uh, did that, then all of their employees would have that uh, that computer to do all the work. And not only that, they'd be saving on, uh, obviously, the uh, travel time because, obviously, some people are traveling an hour or two hours into work every day and then back again. That's four hours in travel. If it, uh, Actually, let, let's go with the one hour one. There's two hours in travel going there and back if there's no traffic, but of course nine times out of 10 people are doing a nine to five, in which case there's traffic and it turns that hour drive into an hour and a half and then back again. So it puts out to like three hours worth of your day gone into travel times that by five. If you're doing five days a week, you know, you end up losing so much time to travel and then, and it's just to arrive at an office and do something that you could have done back at home. And just sent there electronically, a lot quicker, with a lot less issues. <laughs> so that, that, that's my thing with it. Oh yeah, for sure. I remember I was just listening to a podcast probably a couple of weeks ago, Joe Rogan podcast with Mark Andreessen, and he was saying that after COVID, he what they did with their company is they still have physical offices, but they don't you know require people going in as much and and having many offices so what they do is they spend the savings that they've got from not having you know people in the office because you know obviously you got off like you said office space is expensive you got to pay for bills then there's the upkeep you know all that stuff the money that they save they basically you know every so often i don't know how frequent but every so often they hire out like a nice you know hotel or a nice resort or villa or something where they'll have like a few days or a week and they'll invite the employees there and they'll have some meetings, you know, some work going on. But then the rest of the time is basically them to do a holiday and they pay for them plus some, I think, like spouses or, you know, like close family members as well. So basically the family members get a free holiday. They get the social interaction every so often um, without having to always go in the office. And I thought that was a nice way of doing it as well. Instead of saying, you know, well, either always in the office or you know, fully remote, and we're going to have no offices. It's like, okay, we understand that that interaction can be good. Let's just, you know, limit it, and let's actually spend the same the money that we've saved into a really nice way. So I thought that was a, you know, a nice alternative to you know one or the other approach. Oh yeah, no, it is. The thing is, different people do it in different ways. Like my my mother, she works in an office, and she goes mm-hmm. into the office five days a week. Um. I believe she had the option of working from home, but for her, and maybe it's just because of her being a bit older and all that, she was saying that when she was doing the work from home during COVID, um, that she wasn't as, you know, uh, as up and raring to do it as when she's at the office. So she was a bit more productive in the office doing it. But then for me, if you set aside a little space um, to have as a workspace, I find you get that same kind of energy, or at least for me, I get that same kind of energy just being at home. But um, yeah, for sure. it's it's one of those things. I mean, I, I come from uh, bad health and all that, where going into an office ends up being difficult. And so I'm always going to be more remote than some other people anyway. <laughs> but at the same time, just looking at it from a logic point of view, it the amount of money you could save by not doing the office space and like say I mean, doing a, a little party or a get together or even if somebody just went into the office once a month or, yeah. or if everybody went into the office once a month even if they did that that still gives them the other month where they're not losing all that time and um, at the end of the day a happy worker is a more productive worker I I, oh, yeah. I I talk to people all the time that work in different kind of areas, whether it's in offices, retail, what have you. And nine times out of 10, they talk about how they they don't feel respected or um, looked after in their office space. And, you know, they're only paid certain amounts. So they, so, uh, they don't, none of them tell me that they're putting in all the effort at work. They all say, I'm paid this much, so I'm putting in that much worth of effort. You know, I, I'm treated like this, so I'm putting in the effort of uh like to reflect that uh being treated like that 
if people were doing it remotely or tr treated better in general or uh, or you know with doing it remotely the money that was saved maybe went into their wages or a bonus or even a night out uh, as you say they'd feel better about it and they'd work more they'd work harder Generally. Oh, yeah, for sure. I, I think there's definitely, you know, various alternatives to, you know, the, the conventional way of working that has been the, you know, the, you know, the standard for hundreds and thousands, like since the dawn of work, <laughs> like, yeah. that's what it's been. Obviously, technology is more of a recent phenomenon, but before technology, you know, people still went to work. They had the nine to five, whatever the time was, but you, you, you know, you went, you, you, you went there and even though let's say when telephones you know came in and you know you had you know over the phone salesmen even that you know people still went to on an office to do that yeah. no one or not on mass people were not doing it remote even though not long after the probably the telephone launch and the tech getting better cheaper and more accessible they could have done it at home or yeah. you know a hybrid approach so yeah i think that's definitely you know you know, different alternatives. And how did you find COVID, especially considering, you know, it forced a lot of people to work remotely, but be isolated and, you know, all those restrictions? Um, so luckily for me, where I've got my uh, health issues, I wasn't as restricted because I had my, my one person I was caring for is my other half. Um, she was uh, like designated my carer. So where I, at the time I lived on my own, uh, I was allowed to join her household and okay. so I to come over and, and I was allowed that. Um, but aside from that, I, I do a lot of my shopping online anyway. Um, I wasn't going to the gym at the time. So, you know, I didn't have to worry about not doing, uh, doing that either. So, I mean, when COVID happened, it, for me, I... I saw a lot of people panicking and a lot of people being idiots as well, to be honest. Oh, yeah. Which is the same as every other day. It's it's like um, there was someone, um, I'm not going to name names uh, or anything, but there was someone that was complaining, stating that they thought the police officers, uh, because a police officer had, had a go at them during the COVID lockdown thing, they had a go at them, and they were saying there was a police officer was throwing their weight about. Now, the thing is, this person that was being had a go at literally drove from Basildon to South End to buy donuts. <laughs> That's a half an hour drive and they did it during lockdown to buy donuts and then come back to Basildon where they lived. <laughs> yeah, obviously, you know, people don't want to tell the full story. They just want to say, oh, you know, the policeman was being aggressive, you know, they did this. Or that. Again, I don't know the story, so I'm not, you know, siding one way or another, but I know what people are like. No, and that's the thing. They did that, and they were saying that because this police officer told them that they shouldn't have done it. That's all the police officer did. was said, you shouldn't have done that. Go home because we are under lockdown. And they were saying, you know, about how this police officer was throwing their weight about and being, like, drunk with power. I said, no, he's told you to go home because you travelled half an hour out your way for blooming donuts. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so come on. I mean, there better have been some good donuts. <laughs> oh, I can't imagine so. Do you have any family members or close family friends that are developers? And if so, how did that influence your decision to become one yourself? <laughs> None of my family members are coders in any way. <laughs> okay. uh, and as for... I've got friends that I met at university that um, do coding, but uh well they don't even do it as a job um so no i don't really have any <laughs> well, well, that's fair enough uh would you ever switch careers no 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 okay and like just following on to that one how much money would you need to make two switch careers if, if, if at all uh i i wouldn't want to, you, to be honest. You, you, fair enough uh do you code okay so this is more of a I mean, question still for now, but especially when you was, you know, working for a regular company, do you code outside of work and how do you find that? Do you enjoy it as much when you didn't, you know, have a job or have more business stuff that you was coding on? Um, so I, I, I've coded, well, pretty constantly, um, to be honest, even when I was working at HSMI, I was going home and doing different kinds of code, like 
uh, doing games and that coding at home whilst uh, going into the office and doing software coding over there. So I, yeah, I, I code in and out of work and yeah, um, I enjoy, I, I enjoy doing my own programs more because, um, well, it's the things that I've designed or had help designing um, with, from close friends, mostly my other half, let's be honest. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what else to say on that one, to be honest. Um, okay. And so you went to university, you studied, was it computer games development? So, yep. you know, similar to myself, I did computer games programming. Yep. Just a different title for effectively the same course. How did you find the course? And I, I, actually, I'll reserve the next question separately. How, how did you find the course? Uh, I found it fun, to be honest. Um, so I had uh, some pretty good teachers. Um, uh, I, uh, yeah, I had some pretty good teachers that um, you know taught quite well. When I went into university, it was 2012, so it was just when the prices of university just went up. So it was a bit weird. There was a lot of... There was a lot of people that went in. I, I can't remember how many, but I think there was only about four of us, five of us that graduated uh, from the development side at the end of it because um, a lot of people just kept dropping out. I, I don't know. I, I, I honestly don't know why it was a simple enough course to do, but uh, people just kept dropping out. But, yeah, no, I, I found it nice and fun. Uh, met some good people. Uh, one of my one of my best friends I met uh, over there, to be honest. Um, and yeah, the the tutors were uh, were quite nice. Seemed knowledgeable enough on what they were doing. Um, yeah, so it was good fun. Okay, that's cool. Well, I remember when I was at university. I think the there was a student there with me in first year. He because he was a computer games programming course, so the majority of it was coding, not that much design. And he wasn't. He he, he was more of a designer. So he I, I don't know why he went came on the course. Because he even said, you know, I didn't. He said, I don't. I didn't think you would have that much coding. I thought you would have more design. I thought it has programming in the title. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 there, there were separate game design courses, so it's not like oh, he didn't have a choice if he had to, if he wanted to go to this university. They had yeah. other game design courses, but he didn't choose to do that one. When he dropped, so he dropped out after a year. And he either tried to, you know, apply then, or I think he may have got like a temporary job, then tried to apply a year later. But that's when all the course fees increased, like tripled. And he was like, this is just too much. So like literally just because he dropped out and tried to do, you know, the same or like the correct course, like a year yeah. or two later, he, he didn't just because the course fees went from like three odd thousand, which is what I paid per year, to what they are now, which is about nine, ten grand. Yeah, so, like, yeah, I mean, it was the nine and a half grand. Yeah, and I mean, it's 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 a shame because I remember his design was very good, and I remember he he came up in conversation with a, a bunch of friends when we had a reunion a little while back, and it turned out that he was he he hadn't you know gone back studied or done anything, and he was just working odd jobs and you know as like a cleaner or something like that. And yeah. I was like, it, it's it's crazy. Like he was at uni. Uh, I mean, he was, he was doing fine. He, he just didn't enjoy the coding part of it. He wanted to do design. Like I said, his design was phenomenal, uh, especially for a first-year student. But yeah. just one of those things. Yeah, it is, unfortunately. It, yeah. at, at the end of the day, you need to work out what it is you want to do and then work out what it is that you need to do it, I suppose, and then just stick to it, even the bits that you don't like. Oh, yeah, of course. And would you recommend university to people? Oh, tough one. Um, so I would say when it comes to the games development courses, there are courses that are very similar to what I did at university on places like Udemy or Udacity, so online uh, training course things. But at the same time, it's a different experience doing it at university. One, you have the experience of actually going to university, which for a lot of people would be their first uh, experience of living away from home, um, you know, uh, which is obviously uh, quite an experience. And the amount of people... I, I never lived on the dorms myself. I, I actually moved into uh, London from Corringham um, before going uh, joining university 
and uh, then and I just lived out there and I just stayed in the place I was living in when I went to university. Um, so for a lot of people, it's their first experience of living away from home, which is a good experience for them. Uh, but as well as that, when it comes to doing the courses, you actually have people you can talk to. Um, so like, for instance, when I was doing my um, dissertation in year three, what I decided to do was uh, there was an Ouya games console that was made that was... I remember uh, I remember that one, the Kickstarter. Yep, yep. Yeah, I, I actually funded the Kickstarter. I've still got that in the loft somewhere. Oh, well, there you go. My one's in the loft as well, I think. I, yeah. I, I didn't fund the Kickstarter, but my brother got me it for Christmas after it came out, I think it was. So when it came to my dissertation in university, I decided to build a game for the Ouya games console. Uh, and that was what I did. And, you know... I ran into little issues just because I didn't know uh, enough about coding and that at that point. So I ran into a few issues when doing it and I could go to the lecturers and talk to them and find out what I was doing wrong and learn about it. And, you know, that's what I did. Um, and I got the help and, and I got it all working. If you're doing an online course or a stay at home course, you won't have that access. You won't, uh, you, you generally won't have the people that you can, just show the project to and and do it but then it's like there was another home learning course for games development which i was doing before university which was called train to game and they used to send out these little cds had the courses on them had books uh, that went with it and then you had challenges to do and this was done in c plus plus coding um uh, rather than using Unity or anything like that, I use C++ coding uh, using Visual Basic. Um, and, you know, when it came to having a problem with the uh, with one of the projects, I, and I contacted them and said, like, I need a bit of help with this. And they said, is it coursework? To which my response was, everything in your course is coursework. It is a coursework-based learning program. All you give us is coursework. And then they uh, switch, they turn around with, well, as it's coursework, we can't help you. <laughs> you know, so a lot of the home learning courses don't have the people that you can just talk to, show the project to, and get that help and learn from it. So, yeah, I, I probably would suggest university, to be honest. Okay. And what myths about programming did you have before getting a job? Um... Or before even getting into coding full time, and you know the way you're doing it now. Myths I had about coding. Uh, I I don't think I really had any, to be honest. Oh, I don't think I really had any myths about coding. I just kind of went into it and just went, yeah, let's do that. And I, I didn't really think about it. I just did it. So <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, fine. Okay, so. How do you keep up with the latest trends, advances, and programming languages in your field? Uh, I probably don't, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not very good at keeping uh, keeping track of things. Um, <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah. I I just I just get on with my code. I kind of stay in my own little world. Get on with my code and get things done. So I I don't. <laughs> Nice. Okay, so I've got some more fun generic questions now. So would you rather run a 10-person company or a 1,000-person company and why? Ooh, tough one. They both have their merits. Um, probably a 10-person, to be honest. Why um, would that be? And what are the merits that came to mind with both? So one of the merits that came to mind with the 1,000-person uh, company is if you've got 1,000 people in the company and they're all getting paid, clearly the company's making a lot of money. Uh, yeah. Or at least you would hope. <laughs> yeah. If you, you'd hope. Otherwise, there's going to be a lot of uh, unhappy people when it comes to, like, uh, payday. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So with 1,000-person companies, obviously, you can have uh, a lot more people doing different things and get a lot more done. However, with a 10-person company, it's a lot more close-knit. It's a lot more... Um, there's not as much to manage because uh, there's only the 10 people to manage rather than 1,000. And you can actually hear a lot more ideas. There's not there's not going to be as much loss to the void. Um, if you have a group of 1,000 people 
uh, and you ask them all for an opinion, you'll maybe get six or seven opinions. You won't get all a thousand. If you have a group of 10 people and you ask them all for an opinion, you're more likely to get them all. That is very true. Okay. And this is the question I, you know, one of the questions that I love asking people, okay. does money buy you happiness? Uh, I'll let you know when I get some. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> No, money doesn't buy happiness, but money does pay bills. Um, at the end of the day, uh, I I'm like I already mentioned. My main goal with building these games is to build things that people enjoy playing and have fun playing. You know that uh, that's what I want to do. I want to bring a little bit of joy into their lives, give them happiness. Um, obviously, you know, I'm not gonna lie. I need to make money off of it. Otherwise, I'm gonna have to try and go back into an office or something like that uh, which with my health is not a good idea um <laughs> it just doesn't work for me unfortunately um so obviously i need to bring in money um so that i can look after myself uh, so i can look after my other half and just just pay bills you know um but no it's money doesn't buy happiness now <laughs> okay five million pound up front or half a million a year for the rest of your life fun uh so obviously half a million a year for the rest of your life is more money generally um unless you only have a short lifespan left um but with a five million up front you can sort things out straight away and actually probably invest it better and turn it into more than half a million uh, a year so i'd probably go for the five million up front okay and talking about that talking about investing what would be the things that you would lean towards when investing? Uh, well, if I had the five million, <laughs> yeah, if you had the five mil, if I had five million, um, so I'd invest into a company uh, first and foremost, uh, be able to actually do some marketing and that, and get things going to uh, at, even employ more people, so that uh, I can have other people doing uh, artwork and music and that kind of a thing. Um, mm-hmm. And basically turn it into a company that um, people enjoy working at and produces games that people enjoy playing. And then obviously marketing those games to bring the money back. Aside from that, um, I would probably, uh, well, no, I'd definitely get a house and uh, basically get me and my other half um, sorted out, like living together in a nice place together uh, and just, yeah, get the normal things, really. I don't... I don't really have this thing of like getting a giant two uh, 200 foot bouncy castle or anything like that. It's just, <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, um, get the normal things, get a house, get somewhere to, uh, to stay and um, funding for when I have kids. That kind of okay. thing. Okay. And favorite board game? Oh, favorite board game. Um, I don't know. Uh, we play quite a few, I and mean, I, I quite like the uh, sheriff game. I quite like, quite like Monopoly. Um, <laughs> uh, I've got a Sonic the Hedgehog Monopoly now as well, which doesn't play like Monopoly. Um, mm-hmm. I quite like the Disney villainous games and the Marvel villainous game as well. I, 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 I honestly couldn't say what my favourite one is. But it does seem like Monopoly, though. <laughs> <laughs> I've, got, I've got several versions of Monopoly. We've got like Dragon Ball Z Monopoly, you've got Sonic Monopoly, you've got Jurassic Park Monopoly. <laughs> For the Dragon Ball Z Monopoly, what's on there? Is it like characters or is it planets? Uh, yeah, it's so you've got like um, Goku and all that on there. And I, I think I've, I've got to try and remember now. It's been a while since we played that one. Um, uh, I'm I can't remember what I can't remember. I think you um get different characters like you, so you get like the Goku and Vegeta, and you buy them, or you buy Trunks and Goten, if I remember rightly. But uh, it's been a little while since we played that one, unfortunately. Okay, because I do love Dragon Ball Z, and we've got a huge, you know, you know, Monopoly collection as well. Do not have a Dragon Ball Z one though. I might have a quick Google of that one after. No, there's there's two Dragon Ball Z ones. There's Dragon Ball Z and there's Dragon Ball Super. And the Dragon Ball Super one is the Tournament of Power Arc. And I yeah, believe... I'd rather get the Z one if I'm being honest. No, that's fair enough. I, I've yeah. already got the Z one. I'll probably get the Super one later. To, yeah. uh, later, to be honest. <laughs> it, it, it does it go all the way up to Majin Buu Saga with the I Z one? Can't remember. In all honesty, I I cannot remember. It's downstairs. I I. I... Sorry, I can't remember. <laughs> That's fine. 
Favorite video game? I mean, you've kind of Comic already Zone. said that. Yeah, Comic Zone, absolute favorite. Yeah, I, I know that one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What video game are you looking forward to? Oh, um, so there's actually a new Dragon Ball uh, game coming out um, in a in about a week or so, I think. Uh, it's Dragon Ball the Breakers, I think it's called. Or drag- um, so that looks quite interesting. I'm looking forward to that. Um, don't know if there's any others that are coming out that I even know of, to be honest. <laughs> so probably just Dragon Ball the Breakers. <laughs> okay, and so that's basically all the questions that I've got, you know, for today. Cool. One last question before we wrap up: What advice would you give as a developer? Oh, um, don't forget marketing. <laughs> <laughs> Golden yeah. advice. Yeah, um, so one bit of advice that I would give, if you're looking into doing indie game development, um, uh, if, if that's what you want to do, when it comes to marketing, a lot of developers, myself included, either forget about it entirely um, or we leave it until the game's already out before we start marketing it. And that is not the right thing to do. Uh, take it from me. Uh, that's what I did with Defend from Candyland. And whilst I'm getting good reviews, whilst there are people that have played it on YouTube, whilst there are people that have messaged me to say about how much they love the game and all that, and these are people that I don't know that have been sending me these messages. It's not that my friends have been doing it because most of them haven't. Um, <laughs> when it when it comes, to, even with all of that, Defend from Candyland has not done well. It, it really hasn't. When it comes to marketing, you need to do the marketing from the very beginning, even in your game design. Don't just come up with a game and go, this is a great idea, let's go with that. You come up with a design and then you research other games of that genre, other games of that uh, setting. You look into it properly, find out what other people say is missing from their games or uh, from the games that they play and do your market research on that and do your marketing ask questions send it out to the crowd say i'm about to make a game that i'm doing this that, and the other what would you like to see in it i mean that's what notch did with minecraft and um, now obviously with him he was one of the first to do it on the scale that he did but he made absolute millions off of it uh and you know but it was that asking other people and that research at the very beginning he did what they wanted him to do not what he thought was best and that is what really set him apart from the others when he did that. Um, apologies if I got any of that wrong, but as far as I'm aware, that's how uh, how it was. Um, but yeah, so do your research at the very beginning. It's a, it should be the first thing that you do, really. Is research and marketing should be the first things that you do. That would be my bit of advice. Wise words. I mean, it's one of those things you just want to get right into it. You've got this idea. Well, again, that's the curse of any developer. You know, you the problem is that a lot of people have ideas, and you probably heard it before. You know, I've got this idea, I've got this. But the thing with developers, they can actually go out and do it. And unlike somebody who might have an idea that requires a huge amount of money just to get off the ground, let's say if they're creating a physical building that requires a lot more resources, you you know, a lot of people have computers, laptops, so yeah. you can get started for free or you know relatively cheaply and that can blindside people because they you know they don't do the proper planning you know like you're saying they don't research they don't see what you know other people want and it's it's fine if you make a game for yourself but it's important to understand it may just be that forever it may just be a game for yourself and if if that's all you want it to be you never want to release it or you're not care you don't care if it gets downloads or you know sales, and you just want to play it yourself because it's a game that you've always wanted to play. That's fine. There's nothing yeah. wrong with that. But obviously, if you want to create a successful game, you know, there's obviously two parts to that. You know, creating yeah. the game, creating the success, and then the success part of it does not require coding necessarily. It requires very little coding. Exactly. It's like there was a, a a case I remember seeing about many many years ago, not to do with games, but um. It, it shows why the market research is important. Uh, a guy spent thousands upon thousands of pounds putting together a company to sell marshmallows with faces burnt onto them. 
Right, and that was what his product was. He'd come up with this product idea of marshmallows that had different celebrity faces and that on the marshmallows. He put in, got the factory sorted out. He got them made, got the packaging done. Not a single person bought a single marshmallow. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> so he spent thousands upon thousands of pounds setting all this stuff up, but he hadn't actually asked if anybody wanted it. Yeah, I mean, that's the problem. So many times people, <laughs> you know, want to make something because they really want it or they feel like it. Sometimes it's not even what they want. It's they feel like it's what pe- other people want or they see other people doing something and they're like, you know what, they must want, you know, marshmallows and, you know, all oh, whack a face on, you know, or they must want this app, but not asking. Because uh, people might say, you know, I've had this one up. I've had this marshmallow. I don't need any more marshmallows in my life. Yeah. You know, I'm happy with just that one. I needed a marshmallow, but that, you know, craving has now been satisfied. Yeah. yeah. But not only that, who wants a marshmallow with somebody's face on it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, you know, it's one of those things. It's, you need, to, you can make the best game in the world, but if nobody wants to play it, nobody wants to play it. Yep. That is very true. So, yeah, that is it. That is today's podcast episode with Michael Ingram. I just want to thank, you know, Michael for taking the time to come on, talk to myself, and, you know, let everyone know what he's up to. And, obviously, if you let, you you know, share all the links to, you know, your game, your website, etc., your social media, I will plug that in to the description so you can check out Michael's work and what he's up to as well. Oh, thank you very much for having me. It's been lovely chatting to you. Um, anybody uh, that listens to this, feel free to contact me. I'm on Twitter and Facebook and Discord and all those different things. Uh, and I have an email address. I'll send over all of the links over to yourself. Um, so, yeah, feel free to ch- uh, chat to me, um, even if you just want to ask me questions about dev work or what have you. I'm happy to answer any questions that I can, to be honest. And yeah, I, I'm I'm a nice, happy guy generally. So <laughs> I'm not going to. I can tell. I, I think I think we can all tell that you're a pretty cool, <laughs> relaxed, you know, relaxed guy. You Thank don't you. seem like the type of guy that gets wound up over stuff easily. No, I definitely don't. So no. yeah, I, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions. Send me an email or a message on Facebook or Twitter or what have you. Uh, and yeah, I'm happy to chat to anyone basically. Sounds good, and I'll see everyone else in the next episode of Fire Dev. Bye-bye. Enjoy, everyone.